I knew I was like defrauding my family. I just, I knew I wasn't going to do any of those things. We hadn't even signed the record deal at that point. And he was like really getting me to live in Canada again. And I, I don't know if that happens all the time. I was in a taxi with my friend Qais and I remember him saying, I heard the song everywhere today. And I was like, I still haven't heard it yet. It had been out for two days. He's like, I've been hearing it everywhere. We get in this cab and it's on the radio. This is Empire. Stories of exceptional Arabs around the world and their journey to the top. I'm sitting with uh, Majid Al Nasqati, who's one half of the R&B duo uh, Majid Jordan. Uh, you guys appear on the track on tracks with Drake and Khalid, um, and each time Majid Jordan brings a unique style that I personally think elevates <laughs> these tracks. Like for "Hold On, We're Going Home," uh, I've read that that's that was the um, uh, single uh, most that was the most successful single that Drake ever did and I really think it's because of you guys being a part of it um, but we will get in uh, to all of that um, if we can start at the beginning Majid tell me uh, where you were born and where you grew up uh, so yeah my name is Majid al Maskati. I was born in Bahrain um, my family's my Bahraini side of my family is originally from Manama and I lived there until I was 17 years old. And then after that, I moved to Canada for university. And that's where I sort of began my independent journey through life. <laughs> you yeah. said you're Bahraini side. Are you half and half? Yeah. So I used to say I'm half Bahraini, half. My mother is Irish, Scottish. I used to say I'm half, half. But I really think I'm 100% both because I grew up in both cultures and I grew up speaking both languages and uh, going to visit my mother's side of the family. And my mother's been living in Bahrain since the 80s. So that's that's where she still is today. And I consider her Bahraini as well. Um, so yeah, I, I have both cultures and I got to experience the best of both worlds. That's uh, that's amazing. Uh, you know, I'm half and half too. So my, my mother's Egyptian and my dad's American. And I yeah. think uh, secretly, not secretly, I've said this before, but I think we're the answer to world peace because you really understand <laughs> multicultures. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like sometimes in the house we needed world peace to resolve some issues, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I think it speaks to the connectedness of all of us as people. Um, there are so many values that we share and so many differences that are important between our cultures that are, are important to acknowledge, you know, it's, it's nice that my mother likes to celebrate certain things and my father likes to celebrate other things and we can all celebrate one another together, uh, I think, I think, yeah, it's a beautiful thing when worlds come together yeah, and acknowledge one another. A hundred percent. So d describe to me your childhood growing up in Bahrain. Do you have any siblings? I have two younger sisters, uh, Nadia and Hannah. I'm the eldest. You know, usually in that part of the world, the older brother is kind of like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Where are you? But I kind of, you know, I... I I think my sisters probably had to worry about me more than I had to worry about them. And uh, they're amazing. You know, my younger sister, she's a therapist now. My other sister uh, is, uh, she works for a marketing company, but she's she was living in Ireland during the pandemic. Uh, and she just moved back to Bahrain. But, you know, we're very close. And I think just the way we were brought up was to be very relational. Um, you know, we, we take care of one another. We look out for each other. Uh, and my sisters can come to me for anything, and I know I can go to them for anything. So I'm very lucky. Like, I, I had a wonderful family growing up. There are, like, of course, you have to learn certain things, unlearn certain things as you grow older. It's like, okay, this works for me, this doesn't work for me. But we, uh, you know, we, I just spoke to my sister today. So we, we talk as much as possible. That's beautiful, alhamdulillah. You said yeah. uh, they have to look out more for you. Why, why do you, yeah. <laughs> or at least they growing to, up, why I do you think, say that? I think because, well, you know, back home, it's like, as a man, you can kind of do anything, right? Yeah. Like the, the standards are different. It's like, I, I, I sometimes I wonder what would the journey be like if my sister was in my position? And I wonder what that would look like. Would she, she have pushed would she have stayed with it would she have what would she have encountered in terms of like oh you shouldn't be doing this and you can't do that and doing this so 
I, I think like I sort of took advantage of the fact that, you know, I could, I had sort of an openness. I didn't really care if, you know, music or art wasn't a legitimate art for, wasn't a leg legitimate way of life. I, I wanted to discover something new and I thought art for me was the way forward because it, it allowed self-expression it allowed yourself to experiment and fail and, and be okay with that because you knew you were learning at the same time. And so I think my sisters, maybe they, they just worried about me because I can be spontaneous. I like to go with the flow and live in the moment. I think also where we're from, there is an element of that laid back style, you know, where it's like, yeah, whatever happens tonight, we'll start here, go somewhere else. And I, I think that's, that's how I approach the art uh, of making music. It's kind of like not forcing things, taking time, allowing ideas to form and then become whatever it is they're going to unfold into. Yeah. Well, uh, how would you uh, describe your childhood growing up? So um, like, tell me about your parents. What kinds of activities did you do as a family? What, what uh, was, when you think back, what, what was, what was that time like? So I, I grew up in a very traditional environment, I would say. We had to see my grandmother every Friday. Um, and I like, that would be our, our weekly activity. And, you know, my parents were really strict about school and getting grades my father especially uh he's kind of like you know if you don't do well at this you're not going to get to this and you're not going to do that and so and so's son has done this and so and so's this and this universe you know so i feel like since it since i was young i kind of was auditioning for for love or acceptance i i don't think it was an intentional thing but it's just like our parents wanted us to be able to compete globally and be able to, if we so wished, go wherever our heart was taking us, you know? And so uh, when we were young, my, my father loved to just take us to new places. You know, we were very lucky to get to go and see my, my mother's side of the family. And so we'd go to England in the summer and spend time with her. And, uh, you know, growing up, I played a lot of sports. That was my first dream. I think a lot of kids from Bahrain wanted to be football players. Um, I didn't really discover music till later. It's It was kind of hard to to learn music in Bahrain. There weren't that many schools, and we didn't have music class really. In I went to Bayan school. Um, it ended in like grade five. So I didn't rediscover music until I was much older. But, you know, in terms of my family life, it was like very close family oriented take care of the, your elders take care of your family be a good son don't embarrass us you know all those things <laughs> and if um if one of your sister's name is hannah is that right hannah yeah yeah if she had to describe you when you were 10 what would she say about 10 year old Majid? she'd probably say i was a menace because i <laughs> what what what's what's funny is i for some reason, I treated Hannah like she was my little brother. That's what she tells me. And so we would like, we would like play fight and things, but I was much, I'm six years older than her. So sometimes like I'd play fight with her and she'd end up getting hurt and I'd get in trouble. But it was like our relationship, we're very close now. We're very, very similar, I think. And uh, she's, she's just like a wonderful human being, you know? And I think she'd probably say like, I loved her very much, but I was cheeky. <laughs> yeah that's awesome my brother he's uh, not not the same age uh difference i'm one of four but uh the next brother above me is three years older and we used to um wrestle a lot but like he was bigger than me so he'd squish me <laughs> it's a real it's a real thing yeah <laughs> just kids just kids playing you know and it's funny because when i left bahrain i was 17 she was only 11 maybe 10 and i never went home after that and I saw her recently in March of this year. And she was like, listen, like, I'm not the baby sister that you left. Like, I'm grown now. Like, I know all of these things. This is who I am, you know, and, and this is this is my life. And I'm not someone you should be giving unsolicited advice to. I'm someone that can actually teach you a thing or two. So, you know, our, our relationship has definitely evolved and... uh 
yeah, I, I think it's just going to continue to grow like that because we we do truly love and care for each other. That's beautiful, inshallah. Um, we heard that your aunt uh, told you uh, that when you were a baby, you used to sing um, by Ace of Bass, All She Wants, when you were a baby. Yeah, my, it, my mom's sister. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about, and you said, you know, music wasn't as accessible, or, you know, classes ended at grade five uh, and growing up, but what role did music play uh, at, when you were little? Such a big role. Like my my parents always used to listen to music. I believe like my father was a performer that never got the chance to be a performer. He kind of was, you know, the the head of the house providing for the family. What but kind of, of them, performer did he sing? Like Does he sing? He doesn't sing, but he's very funny. He's very engaging. He has charisma, and he can he could have a he could have a conversation with anybody. And he's he's just like walks into a room and you feel his presence. So. I think being around that at a young age definitely opened my eyes, you know, and I was like, oh, that seeing how he moved through the world was inspiring to me. But beyond that, like my mom would always be playing music. She loved Prince. She loved Tracy Chapman, uh, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, all of these artists. And so I, would, I was listening to those people as a child, but also my uncles on my father's side collected records. My uncle Mazen was a DJ. Um, he... He started, I, I would say he's he's one of the pioneers of like the house music scene in Bahrain. Um, yeah, my other uncle, Adil, he uh, collects vinyl records and goes all around the world crate digging. And he has a room just dedicated to listening to music. He gets all of our vinyls when we release them. I make sure he gets them first. Um, and they love, they really, really love music. And it's it's been inside me. Like when I was a child, I was singing, all that she wants is another baby while I was still wearing diapers. And I'd be banging on, you know, my my aunt said she was painting her apartment and I was banging on this uh, bucket of paint with like two sticks or whatever. And I spilled all the paint on the carpet. So she had to like get rid of this carpet. But I was always, I was a very energetic child. I think I still have a lot of energy. I still have a lot of youthfulness. And I what I try to do is just to give time to that side of myself where it's like, okay, life is for discovery and creation and exploration and just allowing myself to, to follow that path that, that, you know, I, I started as a, as a child. <laughs> I love that. How, how did that manifest as you got older? Is it like, did you do talent shows at Bayan? Did you, I, um, I did, I did, did a couple. Did you serenade? But it was, yeah. It wasn't really singing, to be honest. It was more like acting and comedy. I was, mm. I always was trying to have fun in school because I thought school was really challenging and static. Um, sorry, not st stagnant. It was like I was there from kindergarten all the way through grade 12. And it was like all the same teachers and all the same people <laughs> and the same hallway. And I was just trying to, my, my, I probably drove my parents crazy. I was like, I need something new. Like, it just feels like I'm doing the same thing every single day. So I would love to make people laugh. You know, I'm sure people would say I was a class clown, um, troublemaker, whatever. But I did study hard and I did work hard because I didn't want to disappoint my dad. Um, but I forget what, what I'm talking about right now. What was I saying? <laughs> I, uh, I was, this is going to uh, be a common thing, by the way. Oh, I, like. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I was asking when did, like, how did singing for you start to manifest as you got older? So Okay, so singing came into the picture when I moved to Canada. So I moved oh, to Toronto. Oh, you're kidding. That late? Yeah. Yo, yeah, like. Mashallah, Alik, you're so talented for starting so late in life. That's amazing. Yeah, it really took off. So what happened was I moved to Canada and I moved to a college called Victoria College, which is at University of Toronto. And it's really close to the music uh, faculty. So the, all the musicians would stay at that college if they lived in the college residences and mm -hmm. they'd just go to class across the street. So everyone who lived around me, my roommate, were all in the music program. So I, I learned a couple chords from my friend, shout out to Mohammed Zainal in Bahrain, because they were like a bunch of guys that used to play flamenco guitar in Bahrain. And I just picked it up, but it was like right as I was leaving the country. So I get there with the few chords that I know and I start <laughs> borrowing my roommate's guitar for periods of time. And slowly and slowly, I start taking the guitar for longer and longer. And then he forgets I even have the guitar. <laughs> and I start learning how to play and I start writing birthday songs for people. So I start writing birthday songs for friends as a joke. It came from like, you know, comedy kind of making people laugh. 
Wait, and, wait, wait. Uh, when you say writing a birthday song, so it's more than just like happy birthday to no, like, like, like what would it be? No, it would be like, let's say my friend Mikey, it's his, you know, 18th or 19th birthday at that time. I'm like, yeah, so Mikey, it's your birthday. So and so I know you like so and so you guys should have some fun. This it would be like make a whole story, kind of like make everyone laugh. And I did that and I wrote 10. And people were like, yo, you literally wrote an album of birthday songs, you should try and do an open mic. So I did an open mic at this bar called The Cat's Eye uh, at Victoria College. And it went really well. I did an original song. Everyone loved it. And I was like, this is really rewarding. What I was want the song? To... I can't even remember. I can't even remember. <laughs> okay, okay. Like, I just remember it went really well and people came up and were like, you have a beautiful voice. We love the music. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to take this seriously and try writing my own stuff. Um... And I started a MySpace page back in the day. And I put five five songs up on the MySpace. One of them was Take Off Your Cool by Outkast. I did a cover of that. One of them was Daft Punk One More Time. But I did my own version with my own verse. And I called it Adept Punk. Uh, the third song was T-Pain Buy You a Drink, which I sent to some Bahraini friends with my own verse on it. Uh, and then I had two originals. One was called Oceans. And one was called White Among the Blue. And so I just put those online and school got so intense that I never pursued anything after I had my MySpace. I was like, look, this is my music. If anyone feels it, they can find it there. I can send it to them. And so I stopped doing music after my pretty much my second year on until I graduated because I was like, if I don't pass, like I'm a failure. I'm never going to get accepted into society back home. I'm going to like, you know, I was so like scared for all that stuff. But really, anyone who's listening, don't worry. Do your thing. If you feel like you don't want to go to school, don't go to school. If you feel like this is too much, give yourself time. Life, when God made time, he made plenty of it. So I stopped. And in my last year, I met Jordan. And uh, it was 2011, 2012. And as you know, they call it the Arab Spring, but there was a lot of madness going on in our part of the world. And I was feeling so tense about it because I was away from home at that point for four, almost five years. And I just felt so distant from everybody. And I was just hearing the worst stories and I was feeling so sad all the time. And I was like, I need something that makes me happy. What makes me happy? Making music makes me happy. And Jordan was like, oh man, I, I can hear you're going through a tough time. Like, let's do something. Let's make a project. And we made After Hours, uh, our first mixtape under the name Good People, out of his dorm room at U of T and his parents' basement. And then we put that out. And then I flew back to Bahrain right after I finished school. And it's, we burnt a CD just before I left that found its way to Drake's producer. And he called me and said, I want you to come back to Toronto. I didn't even know you were from Toronto. And since then, we've been like right out of school. I couldn't have scripted it or planned it any better. It was crazy chance and destiny or whatever you want to call it. It just was the right place, the right time. And I was able to move back. I want to I wanna get uh, into all of that. Um, but what did you study in university? I, I was boring. I studied finance and economics and <laughs> commerce, they called it. Commerce. It's like accounting, marketing, all these things. And what what was your plan like before music became a thing, uh, which I guess was in your last year of school? Like, what was your life plan? You'd move back to Bahrain and work for PwC, or like what was uh, the thinking? No, no way. Like, <laughs> I knew, I knew I was like defrauding my family. I just, I knew I wasn't gonna do any of those things. I just needed a degree, and I needed to, I just needed time to figure out where I was going to be and what I wanted to do. I just happened to like go back home. I wasn't going to, I wasn't planning to stay there forever. I was going to like, okay, maybe I'll go here, here, here. But this call came before I could even make a decision. And when it came, it felt right. So I, w I didn't really have a plan. My plan was like finish school and then figure something out. Mm. I, I, you know, as an, as a teenager, it's very difficult to imagine that you can make a living as a recording artist or a songwriter or a performer you know, if I think that's something I would really like to work on in the future and, you know, through your podcast and through programs or whatever, even being more present back home in Bahrain and in that area of just allowing people to let themselves love what they want to love, let themselves dream and imagine whatever scenario, no if, no but, no pressure, like if nothing mattered, money wasn't an issue, family wasn't on your neck, yeah. 
what would you want to do? And I think that's really, that was the moment where I gave myself that opportunity to be like, oh, you, you want me to come back? You know what? I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to just come back. And then it led me to here. Um, and uh, how did you decide on going to Toronto for university? Because that's, you know, really far away from Bahrain. <laughs> how did you pick like, that? Very random. I only applied to like three schools. Uh, I think UCLA, uh, NYU and U of T. And I remember my parents freaking out being like, why don't you spread your options and this and that? <laughs> I was like, I only want to go to a major city because I feel that's where people from all over the world are going to be. I yeah. feel that's where you're going to get a mix of cultures. You're going to get a mix of subcultures. There's going to be a life outside of just studying because I don't want to be a, like a school student for the rest of my life. I want to be, uh, I, I want to be a student, but like not in that kind of confined curriculum sense. You know, I want to yeah. be able to form my own curriculum. So I just I chose Toronto and uh, they spoke English. It was cheaper to live <laughs> in than LA and New York. Uh, and yeah, I, I just I came here and I love it. I'm still here. Was there I'm almost any, Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> Congrats. Was there any culture uh, shock in the beginning when you first moved uh, from Bahrain? Like, what was that first year? I'm sure the cold was a fun. Although I guess yeah. you had a little bit of an experience with you know going to Ireland and stuff. But what what was that? Um, yeah, what was what were your first impressions and what was kind of the adjustment period like for you moving to Toronto from Bahrain? Yeah. So first off, like fashion sense, I all I wore was like <laughs> football team jerseys and shorts. Of course. And like oh. that was my uniform. And everyone's like, why is this guy always in a jersey? And <laughs> like, does he not have jeans? So, you know, I had to switch up the fashion a little bit. And then um, I remember my first year getting to know people. One of my friends invited me over to his house for Thanksgiving, Michael. And... Uh, I remember going to his house and waking up in the middle of the night so thirsty. And like, I need, a, I need a drink of something cold. And in Canada, they sell milk in bags, like huh? in, plast in plastic bags. It's, it's crazy. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> like <laughs> Canadians know what I'm talking about. It's like so Egyptians they sell, with food. They sell okay. milk in plastic bags. <laughs> and I'm going to the fridge to look for something. And all I see is like this bag of what looks like a white liquid. I'm like, is this milk? I don't know. I'm just so thirsty. I didn't know that you could just drink straight from the top at that time either. So I'm just like, I get the, the milk. I like rip it open. I pour like a little glass just to quench my thirst. And I like lean the bag in the fridge, just like, it's like over, like it's hunched over like that. <laughs> and he wakes up in the morning. He's like, dude, what did you, what did you do with the fridge? I'm like, I just saw some milk. I was so thirsty. And he's like, you got to put it in this like plastic holder. And you so like these little things are like the culture shocks, you know, like just like dumb things. But in terms of like, I speak English very well because my mother spoke English to us, you know, and uh, it, it's it's like my first language at this point. You know, I, I don't speak Arabic nearly in, as much as I wish I could. But that's why I want to go back home more to to speak Arabic more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> That's great. And uh, you said you met Jordan, uh, your partner, Jordan Ullman is his last yeah, name? Yeah, Ullman, right? yeah. Ullman, Jordan Ullman in 2011. Um, yeah. Talk to me about how you guys met. Where was it? Uh, what was what, what was the first interaction like? So I was, it was my 21st birthday. It was a surprise birthday. And I had to sneak him into the bar that the birthday was at. Uh, cause he was only 17. He's three years younger than I am. Oh, he was only 18 at the time, I think. And so I get him in and we start talking and he's like, yeah, so I make music. I heard you sing. He knew a friend of mine. We both had a mutual friend. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'd love to make something before I leave. And this is what I'm telling you just before I was about to graduate. And it just lined up so perfectly that I ran into him on the street a few months later. And I was like, yo, we never actually worked together. He's like, come by my my dorm and and like let's make something and we ended up making two songs that day chill pad deluxe and hold tight those were our first two songs that we ever made wait 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 okay <laughs> what goes into making a song was were these songs that you had already written or no we just kind of made them on the spot like based off of the conversation like i don't know what it is but for me i find it i find it very 
easy to come up with melodies. I used to hum all the time in class. I think, oh, I left that that detail out. Growing up, I used to hum all the time and have sounds inside my head that I just, teachers would be like, be quiet, Majid, you're disturbing the class again. And I also forgot that my dad tried to learn the piano at one point. So we had this, we had this like Casio keyboard in our house. He started, he's like, I want to learn how to play the saxophone. And the guy said, slow down, learn the piano first. So he got this, he got this Casio keyboard and the Casio keyboards ended up in my room. And I remember growing up, I would just play the keyboard along to songs. And I would like just songs like, that you would hear on the radio and you would yeah, just whatever like, mimic was playing the... off my computer. And I would just mimic the melodies or play things by ear. And I think that's how very early on just not even aware that I was developing my own kind of ear yeah. for music. That's what was happening. And and I I just remember that detail like the other day when I saw my sister in my old room and I was like, oh, there was there was a keyboard there. And I tried to learn the drums just before I left Bahrain. I was like so hungry to learn how to play an instrument. And that by the time I got to Canada was when I was you know, able to because I had access to people who had instruments, access to like programs that there were pianos in the dorms. There were, you know, so once I got access to those tools, I was like, okay, cool. Now I can actually do these things that I've had floating in my head since I was young. So, so Jordan invites you over, and he's got like a like a recording setup in his in his dorm room, um, yeah. and then and then like I don't know how a song gets made so how, is it he's just like okay here's a melody and then you just kind of hum and then sing along to it like how how, how did you yeah. make those first two songs together yeah exactly so I had these chords that I was playing on the guitar at the time and I he just plugged me in and I recorded the guitar and then on top of that I just he's like okay now just try something just record something and I had a like a paragraph of a verse written um so I just did that on the guitar in one go. And then he said, just keep going. And I just kept singing just random words and melodies. And that ended up becoming the song. It's different every time. I think in the initial stages, it's very easy to follow your intuition because it's like you've been waiting your whole life to express yourself musically, melodically. So whatever, whatever comes out of you, it's almost completely authentically you. Uh, it is. It's just by nature of it. It's the first time you're doing it and you're hearing it back and that's how it goes. But after years and years of doing it, you have to also still protect that essence, mm. I think, of just go and, and, and try what's next and, and don't take it too seriously or like, oh, should it be this or this or that? Like, don't hinder, I guess, the flow of it. And I think we learned that early with each other and we have nurtured it and also protected it over all this time and that's that's still how we work but sometimes you know writing a song like I'll, I'll have words that I've written I, I try to write as much as I can words that make me feel things I read poetry uh, I read stories and I'm always looking for words that make me feel something um, and that's how I know that if it comes to making the music I'll know what makes me feel something as well do you carry like a notebook around with you so you can write down lyrics? I have that come notebooks. To mind or, yeah. yeah, I have notebooks. I have my phone. I have my laptop. I just have any, any, I have a voice, you know, recorder, yeah. like whatever it is, I will try and capture it in that moment. Um, and also like give myself time. And I like to wake up in the day and in the first couple of hours of the day, just kind of meditate on different sentences and words and ideas and like try and form somewhat of a story on a page. Yeah. I love that. That's like a, um, I, I hear it's a, a sign of a successful person to have a morning routine. That's like, you know, includes quiet time and stuff. So it's really yeah. cool. <laughs> no, my house is very quiet here. I live alone and uh, it's kind of out of the city. And I like that. I like waking up and seeing the trees and just, Taken in the morning sunlight, I sit by the window in this chair and I just kind of begin my day slowly. Yeah. I love that. Um, so uh, going back to, to when you and Jordan first met, like what was your impression of him? So I guess you, you met at a party and then uh, your birthday party. And like, what do you remember what you 
thought when you, like when you walked away from that interaction, like, oh, he's a cool guy. I don't know if anything will come of it. Or it was like, oh, this was life-changing. What, what was it like? I remember being surprised by his age and for how much he knew about music, especially mm-hmm. about music that probably a lot of kids his age wouldn't know about. Like he was referencing artists that were French. He was referencing artists that were like, underground British acts. He was very eclectic. His father uh, used to listen to the Beach Boys and psychedelic rock and everything growing up. So he had like a rich history. His father plays guitar as an amazing guitarist. He has like a rich knowledge of music. And I remember meeting him and leaving thinking, wow, he really appreciates music the way that I appreciate music. That's awesome. And, um, And how has your relationship evolved? I mean, you guys have been friends for 11 years. Like, what are you to each other beyond, uh, you know, colleagues and uh, artists together? And and what do you guys fight about? Like, what is your relationship like? Um, I don't think we fight about anything important. It's kind of like <laughs> bickering or stuff. But I, I think that I'm so blessed and privileged to have someone who has dedicated their musical journey to helping me tell whatever story it may be in whatever moment I'm telling it, you know? And he, he he brings his musical knowledge and his proficiency in all the softwares and everything. And he sits down and he's like, I just want to get you to a point where you can tell your story and, you know, I go back to Bahrain and, and record over there and go around the world and, and just connect. I think that's something that like we're working towards now. Like we're going to be in Bahrain at the end of this year and I want to be present there more than I ever have been in the last 10 years. I think about it all the time, how the years have just flown by and I've been on this side of the world and I've never gone back since I was 17. So it's like, I have someone who is a partner who's like, let's go back. I'll come back for two, three months. Let's go work (laughs) out there. It's, It's a very thoughtful, compassionate, dedicated and loyal friend. That's uh, my family. Like my closest, (laughs) the closest person to all aspects of me because we work together, we've lived together, we have so many mutual friends and like worlds that that cross over. So yeah, I'm very lucky. It's it's important, I think, for me as a relational person to have a relationship within whatever it is I'm doing. You know, I can't just do work for the sake of doing. I like to connect with people and I think music is the is the greatest form of connection because you put on a show and people fly in from all over the world and they're enjoying the show for different reasons, but they're all feeling the same thing. Um, It's a beautiful thing. And Jordan allows me to do that with his just dedication and his hard work and his talent. He's so talented. I remember meeting him being like, you are so talented. Where I, today I asked him, I'm like, where'd you get your bass lines from? Like, these are crazy. So yeah, we're, we're very close. (laughs) <laughs> That's beautiful. What um for for somebody who doesn't uh know your music together, so you sing and play guitar and then what does Jordan do? Jordan the other does, half of Measured Jordan. <laughs> yeah, Jordan does everything. He like puts the albums together, uh produces, records, sets up the studio, you know, like he can build a studio in anywhere. We've built studios in living rooms, we've built studios like makeshift things everywhere. He always has his equipment. And he's also, um, I would say, a driving force. More so than just what he does. He he has a, an energy to him that's always driving towards creation. And I think that's that encourages me also to to do the same. And it's it's amazing because when you're in a partnership, any partnership, there's no finish line apart from the time you cross it at the same time together. Yeah. It's not like, oh, like I'm doing this and then we're, I'm going to convince. It's like we have to move and be in communication all the time. It's it's a really good uh, way to learn how to be in a partnership with anybody. And I think that's that's really important for me as a person to just, you know, one day I want to have a family and I want to have kids and all these things. Communication is so important. Um, and he's just he's a great communicator. And I think I carry that with me. Every day we work, I learn more and more about that. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so you guys produced uh, After Hours, which was your first mixtape, and there were like four or five songs on that. Is that right? Uh, um, 
I think seven songs. Seven, seven. or eight. Yeah. Okay. And you said somehow it got in the hands of uh, of Forty, who's Jake's producer. How 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 does this happen? So Jordan burnt a CD, gave me one, and he had one, and he burnt a third CD, and he gave that CD to uh, who someone who's now a friend of ours called Anandan. Uh, who found out that we had made this project, who is good friends, a childhood friend of 40s. Uh, and he listened to the project, loved it, gave it to 40. And 40 was like, ah, I'm not sure. Ended up cleaning his house to the project and was like, yo, these guys are sick. Give me their information. And then emailed me. And then he's told me like, we have a plan to start this record label, OVO Sound. I said, I'm in Bahrain. I don't have status in Canada. He's like, don't worry. I'll fly you back to Canada. He, he basically sponsored me, got me an apartment. Oh my he, God. Forty is someone who is so dedicated. If he really cares about something or cares about a person, he will do everything he can to help them out. And he basically resituated me in Canada and got me a place. He gave me money per month to like get my life together. And then he just got me access to a studio. Okay, okay, okay. So you're you're in Bahrain. You have this email exchange with with Forty, um, yeah. and then like, what do you tell your parents? Hey, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go back to Toronto to be a full time musician. Like, what yeah. what was yeah. what was I, that conversation? What what did they say? They were like, they looked him up, and my dad was like, "This is a serious individual. Go try it." That was it. Was that simple? Because I had done everything he'd asked already. You know. It's kind of like you excelled at school. You studied the like, you know, I serious the, stuff. I did the stuff. And then it was kind of like, well, don't just sit at our house and eat our food. Go <laughs> get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Go get a job. This guy looks like he can give you a job. And, you know? and, and what was the offer? Like, come, I'll get you set up. And then like every day you're making music with us. Or, yeah. Like, what was it, the- he, 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 I remember he got me a laptop and he got me a, uh, a little microphone and he was like just start writing song ideas and making demos um and so in my apartment i had like one couch and i just would start making the demos on the laptop and then he'd be like look i have a studio here just go use the studio me and jordan would go and make more and more ideas and then he's like okay we're working on an album right now i'd love for you to help or contribute in any way it's it was very um, inclusive you know he was like always bringing us into a musical world that was so brand new and amazing, but in a very supportive way, just so genuine. And he was, he was protective of us. You know, he was, he did it in such a caring way. And um, yeah, I just started making demos and then, you know, getting more proficient at making songs, giving him ideas and then him loving certain ideas, not really liking others. And the ones that stuck ended up, being listened to by everyone in the team. You know, it's because it's it's 40, it's Oliver, it's Drake. They have other producers that they work with, like Boy Wanda, Mr. Morgan, who's the GM of our label. They all have an input and opinions on the music and they loved uh, what was a demo for Hold On, We're Going Home. And it ended up becoming like a moment for for that album. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the journey, the full journey. In the beginning stages... <laughs> So I I know nothing about the music world. I mean, is this common, this idea of like sponsoring talent and like nurturing them from the beginning? Or was this pretty exceptional? Uh, I don't know if anyone has like taken an artist, not even a signed artist, but taken someone and sponsored them and given them like a work visa. Because in a record, like we hadn't even signed the record deal at that point. And he was like, really getting me to live in Canada again. And I, I don't know if that happens all the time. I really don't. And I, I find that that's a big barrier to why a lot more artists can't cross over to this side of the world. It's like immigration is so difficult and it's so, there's so much talent where we're from. And what's really exciting about now is that there's a hunger and a desire to nurture that talent you know you see what's happening in the gulf and you see what's happening uh, like saudi now has music festivals which is like i lived right by saudi growing up and i never really went there 
they would all come to Bahrain to party. So it's an exciting time. And I, I just, I want to be back in Bahrain. I want to start, you know, we have dreams and, and me and Jordan talk all the time. I want to start a music program. I want kids to be able to have access to those tools to express themselves or make the kind of music that they feel like needs to be made that they can't find anywhere else in the world uh, in their own voices. So I think that's the next step, really. I, I, I love that so much. Um, t talk to me a bit about where you get your inspiration for songs. So you have this quiet time in the morning, you sit in your chair, you have your coffee, kind of look at the trees. I know um, Waves of Blue, one of your songs was inspired by uh, like looking out at the sea in Bahrain, for example. Like where where do you get, yeah, and, and how much do you think um, of your, you know, uh, heritage and and being half Arab, like how much of that influences uh, the music that you make? A lot, uh, because the music is so much. So much of music is feeling. There is theory and formulas and all this stuff, but really, ninety nine percent is just feeling. And I think we hold emotions and traumas and feelings inside of us, and so. Growing up in certain areas, you you have access to these things that you've experienced that once you put them on record, put them on wax, it's like it's it's coming from you. So it's it, it there's always going to be that influence reg regardless of if I'm aware of it or not. And um, I'm very inspired by nature and Bahrain's a small place. So there's not a lot of diverse nature there. It's kind of like flat desert sand. But the most beautiful thing I, th I find about Bahrain is going to the water. I used to sand by the water all the time. The sunsets are incredible. Uh, and I find myself going back to that imagery like nine times out of ten. <laughs> Um, so, okay. Uh, so uh, to kind of go back a little bit in time, you are in Toronto in that first year post-university, uh, you're kind of being apprenticed, uh, if that's, if I can use it as a verb, yeah. uh, by 40, you're working with Jordan, um, and the two of you are like every day making music. How, uh, tell me about the inspiration for the, for making the song, Hold On, We're Going Home. And then how did that translate to a conversation with Drake? Like at this point, had you met him or was he just yeah, somebody yeah, we, who I, heard? I okay. met him. I met him the day I met 40. And it was at this place. Oh, called, no way. It was at this place called Noble Studios. I show up at the studio, buzz me in. They're in the top room upstairs because the sub and the bass sounds better than the main room downstairs. 40 is all about <laughs> the best sounding room. I go upstairs, 40 <laughs> rolls in, me and Jordan meet him crazy he's like yeah we're starting a record label this this that and i would love to hear some stuff you guys made so we we move to the studio room we're playing stuff then someone buzzes in and drake enters the room and that's that's where we met and uh 40 told me after after we left and played the stuff he like went to him and he said we got to sign this guy i drake said that to him i that if my memory serves correctly, like <laughs> I can, I, I could double check, but he said something like, we got to sign this guy or something, you know? And so, uh, uh, it felt so familiar, even the way that they worked with each other, the way 40 and Drake, um, can rely on one another to deliver what it is they need to bring to the table, you know? And I think there's a lot of trust that goes into these musical relationships because it takes a lot of time. You know, for yeah. a producer to sit down with what Jordan does, to sit down and mix and arrange a song and get it to its final place, they have to really be dedicated to the project. And I, as a vocalist or singer, whatever, I trust him to see that time through and he delivers literally every time. And 40 and Drake are very much the same. And I think what people need to know is if you're going to go into any sort of journey, and I think we know this just culturally is that it takes a village all the time you need a lot yeah. of help you need to build a sense of community you need to uh motivate yourself and and take care of yourself so that when you're around others they can feel that energy and and aspire to it you know we met 40 and we aspire to be uh as dedicated um to making music as, as we possibly could because we saw him living the life he wanted to live and making incredible music 
I was just like, this is a, this is the dream. This is, this is what we want to do. What, um, what was it like meeting when Drake walked in? I mean, did you flip out? Cause like, <laughs> I think I would have like, what, like, yeah. What was yeah. that experience like? It was, it was surreal, you know, to, to be on a plane less than 24 hours ago and then to be in a room with right now he's the biggest artist in the world but at that time he was one of the biggest artists in the world as well and I, re I remember sitting down with like my friends in Bahrain and telling them so I'm gonna go <laughs> to Toronto to make music I don't know exactly how to describe what I'm gonna do and then you're in a room and you're standing there with these superstars you know 40 and Drake and they're just speaking to you human level and they're like, yeah, we're working on this, this and that. They play you some incredible music and they're just like, yeah, so we'll see you soon. And you're like, okay, cool. I'll see you soon. This is life now. <laughs> this is life now. This yeah. is life now. It's, <laughs> and I think that's a good attitude to have is that this is life. You know, these, these, these wonderful things happen and you come into contact with incredible people. It could be, you know, someone that's a musical giant, but it could also be someone who's like, still starting their journey like me and Jordan like I got to meet Jordan it's the same kind of feeling you know it's it's just you receive it you receive mm -hmm. it and you you go forward with it and it, I was I was just lucky to to have that experience and uh, there's like a, a child in everybody that re gets to that moment where they realize they've lived a dream and I think that's that's really my hope is to at least find ways to give people that feeling, you know, where they get yeah. to realize their dreams or get encouraged to try new things. Um, it's not about being super cool or being super massive. It's about, I think, being the someone that makes music that can be the soundtrack to some to moments in people's lives that can uplift them or or make them feel something or be thought provoking inspiring that's that's really it and that's how they approach music they're looking for moments they're not just looking for you know the biggest craziest coolest thing they're really looking for moments all the time yeah um talk to me about the process of making uh hold on we're we're going home uh like how i mean does that get made in like a day does it get made in three months like what did you go into the studio every day and it's just repeat 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 like what it, what was that process like yeah, I mean, 40, we just made the demo and then like all of that final production really goes towards, the, it's the artist's discretion. So it's whatever Drake and 40 decide and think is the final product. We just kind of like wrote the song and uh, we handed it to them, you know? It's 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 always up to the artist. It's and, and it's never over until you hand it in for mix and it's out. You're always mm. tinkering with things. Time is the best editor. So the more time you have to work on something, the more time you'll be able to sit with something and, you know, figure it out. Yeah. Um, okay. So this uh, single goes live and um, can you describe, okay, a couple of moments. The first time you heard yourself on the radio. Um, I was in a taxi. Okay, tell me this one. <laughs> First time I heard myself on the radio, I was in a taxi with my friend Qais, and I remember him saying, I heard the song everywhere today. And I was like, I still haven't heard it yet. It had been out for two days. He's like, I've been hearing it everywhere. We get in this cab, and it's on the radio. And we look at each other, and we're like, wow, it's actually happened. Um, but yeah, we hear, our, we hear our stuff on the radio now all the time. It's kind of insane. And you hear it in places like people are like, I'm in Finland, I heard you. I'm in Indonesia, I'm listening to you. I'm in here... So it shows you like how connected everything is. It really shows you like music can move people here and move people there the same way. Um, but it's it's insane. I, I'll, I remember sitting in the cab just being completely shocked and I got to share that with a friend. Once again, going back to that relational aspect, you know, yeah. things are meant to be shared and music is the way we share. Did you just like catapult to fame? Like what was what was the aftermath of that for you as as Majid? I mean, I don't know really what what fame like we're not we're not famous in the sense that like people are going to stop us on the street and are you that? But the, it's it's like a if you know you know basis. 
you know, mm. after all these years, because that happened many years ago. We went on two world tours since then. We put out more projects. So you can see how things shift over time. Like in, in one moment, it's like the hot thing and this is that. But then, you know, life moves on. And it's like, where does the journey take you? And like where we are right now, it's like, if you know, you know. Some people don't know where two people. Some people don't know how I look, but they know the music. Like I've met so many people mm. who are like, oh, so what do you do? I'm like, yeah, we're well, I'm part of this group called Maja Jordan. They're like, you're Maja Jordan? Oh my God, I love <laughs> this and this song and this and that. So I, I enjoy the fact that people discover the music first because I think... That's really what it's about at the end of the day is the music that we're making. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like right now, it's like I'm just kind of living life and making music. We were recording in LA. Now we're recording in the studio where we made Hold On. We're going home with 40 and Drake, uh, working on our own stuff. We're going to go back to Bahrain and record there too because it's important for me to feel like that is a part of my musical journey, the place that raised me, the place that informed so much of who I am. I want to make yeah. sure that I give myself time to make art there as well. And this is where I am in my life now. It's after being trapped in the pandemic, it's like, what are we trying to do? We've lived so many dreams. We've gone on world tours. We've played Coachella. We've, we've, you know, we've had uh, top 10 singles. We've worked with amazing, incredible, big artists written for a lot of people. But what are we doing now for ourselves? And I think going and making music at home for me is like serving a purpose that's like bringing me closer to my roots. It's allowing me to spend time with my loved ones. Because it's like all these years I've been in a long distance relationship with my family. You know, 17 years old, I'm 31 now. I never went home. I see my family once, what, maybe two weeks a year. Sometimes I don't go home. Sometimes I don't get the chance to go home. So... Moving forward, it's like, what what's important to you in life? And I think I'm asking myself that question more and more. It's like, okay, what's important to me is that I continue to make music that inspires me and makes me feel something that I can share with the world. What's important to me is to be around my loved ones. What's important to me is to always encourage people to, uh, you know, go after what it is they truly dream of. It's not easy. But I want to be a source of encouragement for that. And I want to let people know that, okay, if I can give you any lessons from my failures or my successes, this is what I've learned. And here you go. I think that's yeah. really what's pushing me forward right now. I love that so much. And it's also a testament, I think, to like the maturity, <laughs> you know, of of like, inshallah, like you've, you've accomplished so much. Um, and now it's, yeah, looking ahead at like, okay, what what else drives me? Like I've yeah, done. Yeah, like we have a platform. Done stuff. We've done all mm. these things and it's like, you know, fame and celebrity and all of these things. That's like a world, but it's a world. It's not the world. And so how do you go into the world and touch people in the world? And with the platform that we have, we, we have to give back more. We have to be present more. Um, yeah, it's just we, we, we have to just experiment and try new things and, and going back to Bahrain is, is going to be something like that and like every time I meet an artist that I work with or come into contact with I'm like I'm bringing you to Bahrain trust me I'm going to bring you to Bahrain and they're like I'm there I'm there every time they're like I would love to I would love to so I just want it to be a place that people pass through and bring their energy to because when you're a performer you go around the world my sister said she said this to me. You go around the world and you you touch stages everywhere and you leave a piece of you everywhere you go. And your energy is scattered. And you have to recenter it and, and, and kind of bring it back to you. And that for me is like something I never really gave myself. And I want to now by going back to Bahrain, recentering it so that when we do go out again, it's like whole. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the... But first time you did a, a huge performance, uh, what, was that for Hold On, We're Going Home? Yeah, like that was crazy. Um, I'd rather not talk about it because it was like complete shock. I wasn't prepared. I hadn't really performed live. Um, but I remember like first performance where I was really, after I had, you know, prepared and been experienced a little bit. I remember doing Coachella. Um 2017 I believe and I remember doing that and understanding 
what Coachella meant because I had only heard about it. You know, it's like a myth or a legend. And people were like, yeah, Coachella, this, this, that. But when you go and see the scale of it and you perform there and you see Bahraini flags in the audience, my oldest friend, my oldest friend in the world flew out to see me at that show. And I remember seeing him in the crowd halfway through the set. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it, you know? And that I'll never forget that day. That that performance for me was like, wow, I've I've really done everything I've achieved. I've 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 done it, I've achieved everything I, I could have even dreamed of doing in the world of music, you know? Yeah. What what do you do uh to like mentally get into the zone before a huge performance like something like Coachella? Like how, how do you just yeah, pre- like just prepare, I get you know? stage fright. What do you do? Just prepare. Uh Kendrick said, you know, someone asked him, they're like, yo, do you ever get nervous? He goes, why? They go, what do you mean? He goes, I'm prepared. So you just, if you prepare, you rehearse, you have a clear vision, you know what the set's going to be like. You've, you've, you've thought about yourself on stage. You've thought about the audience receiving what you're doing live. It's, it's going to work out. That's uh, very inspiring. I think I would still like, uh, it took me a long time to get comfortable with public speaking. I was, especially in university, my God, I used to be so, so shy. Um, but but I, 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 I completely see what you mean. I think it's just a matter of, yeah, like not getting into your own head, you know, and just focusing on the message that you're trying to get across. Yeah. Um, also, life is messy, you know, it's not going to be perfect. And... Uh, you have to enjoy it. You have to, because it's that energy is contagious and it's felt. So, you know, going on stage, just realizing what a blessing it is to even have the opportunity to go out there and sing for a bunch of people that have paid money, taken time out of their day, traveled, brought their friends, maybe convinced a friend that didn't even want to come. Trust me, these guys are great. That You know, like all these stories are happening within you just walking from the dressing room to the stage. So I I also like, I don't take, I, I'm not afraid to look like a fool, you know? I, it's cool. Like it's maybe I do something and I trip up or whatever, but I'll get back up and I'll learn from that. You know, I, there's an element also of like not caring too much. Like don't be too precious. Don't be too precious. There's leave room for error. Leave room for growth. So, uh, that's really all I can say about that. <laughs> um, uh, so, okay. So you signed with um, the, the record label. Uh, remind me what it's called. OVO Sound. Yeah. OVO Sound, which is under Drake and Forty. Uh, Drake, and then, Forty, and Oliver, yeah. And Oliver. And as part of that, um, are you like, do you have to come up with an album every year? Is it just like, as the music comes to you, like what, what is the scope of being signed to a label? I mean, when I started out, I thought like you had to have, you had to pump material out all the time really quickly. But I think it's like, a that's not real. That's someone else's, <laughs> that's someone else's imagination, you know? And I think great things take time. Uh, the best things take the most time. So now where I'm at, after putting three albums out and, in, and a, f- a couple of mixtapes, it's like, take as much time as you need. And like I told you, they say in Ireland, when God made time, he made plenty of it. I really <laughs> abide by that. It's, it's like, what is the anxiety here? What is the pressure here? If you really believe in it, what's the difference if it comes out next week or in a year from next week? Yeah. So... Uh, Right now, it's it's kind of like experientially driven, this project. I want to go back to Bahrain, and I'm going to go back to Bahrain at the end of the year. So that's most likely when things are going to be wrapped up. And how would you describe your music to somebody who doesn't know who Majid Jordan is? Like, what, what what's your style? What's your vibe? What can people uh, expect? I try to write uh, loving songs that are truthful, uh, feel that make you feel good and are uplifting with rhythm and groove. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, in 2018, you guys performed in Bahrain for the first time, right? You did a concert in Bahrain. Yeah, we did. 
Yeah, that was crazy. What was that like? Like crazy. going back to your roots and, and, you know, growing up, I mean, like the only concerts I ever went to in Bahrain were, were like techno DJs, like David Guetta and like Tiesto. Yeah. And so it's not common to have a live kind of performance. Um, I'm actually, what, I'm actually kind of, like? I'm kind of sad that we haven't done more there, but that's going to change. And I also yeah. want to be uh, a connection between my artist community and that country and that part of the world. I want to be able to call up my friends and say, let's go do a festival. Let's go do a show in Bahrain. It's not a traditional stop on any tour route, but I worked so hard for so many years that I want to make that change. And I think we we can, you know, I know we can. So uh, that first show was like an eye open experience to how supportive uh, our fans are over there how inspiring what we're doing is to them. And I remember some kid like, so it's a, it was a seated venue. And, you know, we, we make music that's danceable music. And I was just like, everybody get up. And I, I remember like the, organi- <laughs> the organizers are like, what do you mean get up? They should be standing. They have assigned seats. But I told everyone to come down to the stage. So all these kids rushed down to the stage. And this one kid, he like touched my shoe. And he, he <laughs> and he like, he lifted his hand up and he was like, like this. And then all the kids around him were like, oh my God. Like, ah. and like we did the final song. We walked off. Anyway, the show ends. My mom's like, Majid, come back here. I'm like, what? She's only gone and gotten like 300 fans from outside to come and meet me. So I, I meet like 300 people. I'm like, all right, thank you so much. And we leave. But it was crazy. And it was a different age demographic because it was an all ages show in Bahrain. When we tour in the States or Europe, it's like 19, 21 plus. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it was just, it was cool to see a younger generation just being so receptive to it. And then my whole family was there. I remember seeing my uncle just like this thing. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, I, I can only imagine how precious that moment was. That's awesome. No, very precious. Um, uh, so, I mean, obviously, like signing to, um, to, uh, and I, I keep forgetting the name, o- Ovo? Ovo? Ovo Sound. Ovo, Ovo yeah. Sound is a huge deal. Um, and, and of course, like with all those resources and, and, and what you've been able to do with creating music from that. But it's also a case that you've heavily influenced, I think, the label and heavily influenced certainly Drake and his music. And, and um, not only like with writing, uh, Hold On, We're Going Home, but then, there's a song, I think, in a couple years old called Only You Freestyle, where he starts to speak in Arabic. Um, so there's like a line where he says, like, Habibti, please, and I keep into one ahda. Like, did you write that? Like, what, no, t- talk no, to me no, about I oh, didn't, No way. I really? didn't write that. No, he's very, he's just a very worldly person, you know, and he's, he has a lot of people from all over the world around him, you know, and he's he's just open to all kinds of cultures. I did not write that line. I remember hearing that and everyone was asking me, like, did you write that? I'm like, no, man, I didn't even know the song was happening. Like, I'm just trying to write my my current album right now. I should maybe, th- you know, I want to, I definitely okay. want to write a song in Arabic, but I want to do it on that side of the world. You know, I want to do it. In, in Bahrain. Yeah. I want to do it in Bahrain. Yeah. I want to write an Arabic song in Bahrain. So. I think that's why it's like important to be there for more than, you know, two weeks a year and just like work out there. Yeah. What are some of uh, your favorite uh, Arabic music influences? Like some some artists that you really love? I um, love uh, Ziad Rahbani a lot. Mm. I think he's so talented. Uh, Fairuz, Nancy Ajram, Hamra Diab, uh, Hamid, Sh- I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Hamid, Hamid- Sinno. No, Mishra there's Hamid. Alayla? No, oh, Hamid as well. Mashru'a Layla, I did. Yeah, I love them as well. Uh, there is a, I think it's Hamid Sha'ari, maybe, or Hamid oh, Sha'ari. He has this song I'm called sure. Ayunha. Okay. Ayunha, Lon al Bahar. Have you heard that one? <laughs> I haven't. It's no. a good song. So that one, then there's this guy called Ahmed Fakroun, who is Libyan, who I think is like so, so sick, so funky, like his music. North African music has just really good bass lines and grooves. And it came because the United States had jazz ambassadors back in the day. And these jazz ambassadors went out to Cairo and they went out to Lebanon and they taught them like black jazz musical grooves. 
And they oh, brought those, yeah, they brought those rhythms to that side of the world. And so all the music at that point came from like jazz bands that became groove bands that ended up working with Arabic speaking vocalists. So uh, it was, it's a cool, like to see the evolution of that music and how that rhythm is still stayed with us. Like I still make rhythmic music because of that, you know? So, yeah. That's awesome. Um, how how is your music received, or is it received differently between like fans in North America, uh, and then when you go back home, or or any sort of concerts that that you guys do, um, like across the Arab world? Did you do you see there's is there a difference in the reception? Um, I don't know. I think like people where we're from are a little more reserved, you know, like in. And like, if if they have had an experience to it, I don't know if you're, you're likely to hear what that experience was right off the bat in a conversation. Whereas like on this side of the world, everyone's kind of like, oh my God, your song, this one, I cried to, and then I got married to, you know, like back home, it's kind of like, I like this song a lot. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, you know? So there's like that kind of difference. I think like how how much people are, comfortable with sharing uh mm. but also like there's a whole portion of the population i think in bahrain that just doesn't engage with this musical world you know they just like mm. it, they like it's, they does either it's not they don't want to understand it or it's like not part of their daily thing or doesn't speak to them so it's cool because you can have people that are really into it and you can have people that are like shino majid jordan <laughs> what is my like Shino like well, I don't know this guy so it's cool it's 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 real life you know yeah yeah um I wanted to ask you about the name how did you guys decide on Majid Jordan as your name is it just obvious like 40 Jordan, actually 40 called me he's like you guys should just put your names together call it a day and I was like you know what it's kind of cool if we introduce ourselves as Majid and someone goes Jordan then you always get this moment where people are like wait a minute you're Majid you're Jordan so it, was, it was like that, you know? Yeah. That's cool. Um, I don't want to pry too much into your love life, but do you ever serenade like crushes or like your girlfriends? All the time. Is that like, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> How do you think I started making music? No. <laughs> it's love. It's a love language. Yeah, it um, is. That's awesome. No, I, uh, I'm a very loving person. Um, I, I make, love songs um you know i draw from personal experiences i think also like music is a it's a way to test out fantasies as well you know what i mean it's like to create worlds out of maybe like maybe like it's 10 percent true but then you can like follow this feeling and it's like where would it have gone if that was the case you know oh my god that's so philosophical and poetic that's beautiful Majid. <laughs> <laughs> i really you. like that yeah. <laughs> um, and that's I feel like that's the the point I'm at right now in life is like testing out those fantasies where it's like okay what would it be like if I went and recorded a portion of the album in Bahrain what would that look like how would it feel let's go do it you know uh what would it be like to uh throw a festival in Bahrain let's find a way to make it happen like these are all fantasies that you that just as much as my music career are in the air right now but could very much be experienced by me and by whoever is there you know uh what are what are some things that you're excited about coming around the corner this is a year of rest for me personally where it's like no real shows i've done like there was a year where we did over 100 shows and toured everywhere and it was you know going That's to like australia one every three days oh yeah. my god yeah yeah we've 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 had years where we've done over 100 shows and so now it's kind of like okay Creation mode requires rest, requires focus, requires uh, time. And so this year I'm just kind of traveling, seeing the world, and uh, going to end up in Bahrain to finish the whole project. I, I, <laughs> I'm really excited for your return. I think that'll be really nourishing for you when you go. And of course, being with family, you said your mom is still there, right? Yeah, I know. My whole family lives over there. I, a lot of people yeah. don't know that I'm Bahraini and moved to... Canada. A lot of people think I'm a Canadian artist or that I don't even speak Arabic. Like, <laughs> I'm Arabic. 
<laughs> ما عليكم مني I get everything okay like and I it's funny because you meet people from that side of the world they're like oh Majid so where are you from they're like oh I thought you were Jordanian because your last name's Jordan it's funny even <laughs> even after all these years people are still getting to know us on a personal level but they know the music which is I think the most important thing you know that yeah. they've had moments to the music the way that we've had moments making the music Um, and that's what we're working on, creating more of those uh, momentous occasions, momentous musical occasions. <laughs> I like that alliteration. Um, okay, this is a bit of a morbid uh, question, but I think it's telling. Um, so, Lesamahla, and hopefully, inshallah, this happens, Yani, like a hundred years down the road. Um, but what would you want the first line of your obituary to read? Uh, Take as much time as you need. Yeah, I hope it says like a good a good man. <laughs> you know, because there's so many oppor- like there's great and then there's good. You know, you could be great at what you do, but you aren't what you do. You you're so much more than that. And I think uh, it's important to be good. It's important to be kind and thoughtful and compassionate and uh, understanding because. That's really what life is about. I think that's the lesson here of this whole experience is to connect with people and hear them out. Everyone wants to be heard. So I'm doing a lot of talking on this podcast right now, but I try to listen as much as possible. And I think, uh, you know, because you can do one thing and then another thing and achieve this and gain like another material thing. And it's like, to what end? To what end? Where does it stop if you're not a good person? So a good man would be a nice start to whatever it may be after that. I love how philosophical you are in the way that you think about your art um, and, your, and your craft. And it is very much something of like, we really aspire that people who listen to this will, um, will be like, oh, I, I can do that. You know, like that's how it happens. Like I can, you know, so, so inspirational as well as informative. But um, is there anything else that I should have asked you about your journey? Um. I think just, you know, even with all of these things that we've done and the achievements and the experiences, it's like we're still learning, you know. We're still learning how to deal with life that is becoming harder and harder every day for people, you know. the We're like in a really, we're in a crazy recession right now, you know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Um, there's a lot of injustice and there's a lot of just tension and unrest. So I think one thing that I'm on right now in my journey is like taking care of myself, learning to breathe, embracing happiness, you know, because you can die for ideas and for ideologies and things like that, but you don't have to. You can like Make a proclamation by just taking a deep breath, being present, stating what it is you want to do, and following through with that in a disciplined, loving, intentional way. And that will bring you, I think, closer to the world around you. It will just attract more of that and bring it to you. Yeah. Um, I hope, I hope, inshallah, that the, the time in Bahrain is going to be really fulfilling. And I am so excited for this music program um, and kind of helping to, to grow the next generation of Let's make of it happen. Talent. You know, I know you, yeah, you're, a su- you're a superstar. So it's like, let's get, let's get these conversations <laughs> going. I think it's just a matter of like c- reconnecting with everybody and, and being present. Yeah. You know, it's so important to be around. You have to exist in both places. You can't just be you know, working on music in North America and never going home and then saying, you know, I'm Bahraini yeah, and yeah. this and this and that. I feel in my position right now, I, I need to dedicate time to that part of the world and be present for, you know, aspiring artists or my family and friends or anyone who's just looking to expand themselves and what it is they do. And so that's really what I'm looking forward to. That's why I think it's going to be fulfilling because it's something I've waited to do Till I, I thought or till I believed I was in the right position, you know, and, and 10 years of working on this side, it's like, I'm so lucky. I can pick up a phone. I feel like I can just, 
I have real people that I can get in contact with and they'll be like, let's go do it. You know, let's, let's yeah. go bring that to life. And so uh, it's now just a matter of being able to bring more people into that world and giving them access to those, those tools or their, the, the means of, of producing music, art. I think art is so important. It's so, so important for self-expression. And I think me personally, I, I was always kind of anxious to express myself truthfully in scenarios because a lot of times I was punished. You know, so I, there was like a duality to myself and there was like a duplicity. But I was really just trying to protect myself from like not getting told off or, you know, not getting detention or grounded or whatever, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think it's just important to be really honest, but also when you tell the truth, make the truth bearable for those that need to hear it. So being yeah. really thoughtful with when you're going to tell the truth and what what you're trying to communicate and how to move beyond that, I think. So, yeah, I, I think just using art as that a vehicle is is why I think it's so important to protect and to, to continue to push for its growth. That's awesome. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to, to share or say before I give you a huge virtual hug? I just love the kids, yo. I want the kids to succeed. I want them to live out their dreams. I want them to go around the world and I want them to feel free to express themselves and imagine uh, possibilities of a life filled with art and discovery, self-expression. It's just, that's really the mission. Because I remember me being young and being so confused and being like, why can't I do certain things? Like, why isn't this allowed? Like, why, you know? I just, I want people to find... Uh, joy in, in knowing that anything can exist in, in, in the world if, if you dedicate yourself to it and really believe it you have to really believe it yeah. don't take advice from someone you wouldn't trade places with you know <laughs> trust your voice trust your voice for real people are gonna say a lot of things they're gonna you know judge you criticize you um, but they're also going to flatter you to the point where they're serving your ego and they're going to give you like a big bubble head. But just <laughs> always remember to go back to your voice and what it's telling you and in the quiet and the knowing in the quiet. Remember to do that and go there. That's it. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Majid, I thank you so, so much for your time, for, for your beauty, for your music that decorates so much of my life. Oh, um, thank you. I'm... I I I am and will continue to be so proud of everything that you that you bring out into this world truly really. 